Hello everyone, my name is Borisov Gerasimov and I'm a, a, a communications and advocacy coordinator at the Global Alliance Against Trafficking Women. Uh, and I'm here with uh, Sharmila Parmanant, a PhD student in Gender Studies at the University of Cambridge and Vandana Patanaik, International Coordinator of the Global Alliance Against Trafficking Women. So we, Sharmila and GADW decided to uh, do a series of online conversations um, where we will invite um, uh, different uh, people to reflect on the 20th, this 20th anniversary uh, of the UN Protocol Against Human Trafficking, the so-called Palermo Protocol. So this is our first episode uh, where uh, uh, we invited, uh, we, we will be speaking with Bandana Patanaik, uh, GADW, uh, is one of the um, largest global uh, organizations or networks working on the issue. And uh, this is why we decided to, uh, to start with her. So over to you, Sharmila. Thank you, Bobby, and thank you, Bandana, as well. Um, I think a good place to start would be if, Bandana, you can just walk us through how and why did GATW um, start engaging with the trafficking framework? Okay, uh, thank you Sharmila and thank you Bobby. And I think this was Sharmila's idea. So thank you <laughs> very much for thinking of this. I think it's a good time, uh, you know, these two decades of the protocol provides all of us with an opportunity to reflect. I have to start with the clarification. I am not a founding member of uh, GATW, the Global Alliance Against Traffic in Women. Um, but I have been working here for uh, 20 years. And uh, when I came to GATW, GATW was five years old. And um, so for, uh, for having worked here for a long time, I have also have had the privilege to interact very closely with the founding members of GATW. So on my part, what I can say that uh, by nature, I'm very curious. I like to hear stories. I want to ask, I always ask questions. So because of all that, yes, I do know a little bit about the journey, why, how uh, this alliance started. I think, um, it was a conscious decision uh, because GATW basically was launched to, as, as our name suggests, Global Alliance Against Traffic in Women. So it was launched to address the issue of uh, trafficking. And at that time, the official term of trafficking in persons or human trafficking was not yet uh, sort of popular. So people were still referring to uh, traffic in women. And then there were groups already like, say, for example, uh, the Global Network, which addresses the issue of child trafficking, ECPAT was already operational. ECPAT was looking at child trafficking. Um, in fact, uh, ECPAT initially started by looking at uh, uh, child uh, pornography uh, in the context of tourism. So, so this was a very conscious decision. And how this decision was taken, I think there was perhaps about uh, almost a decade of thinking among the um, founding members. So sometime around the 1980s, uh, some of the founding members coincidentally were um, in the Netherlands. Uh, some of them were students at the Institute of Social Sciences. Uh, some of them were activists. Um, working on women's rights in the Netherlands. And uh, that was also the time the issue of traffic in women, trafficking in women was kind of resurfacing. It was kind of, hard. people were talking about it again. And, um, and it's very important to sort of uh, link this to the larger uh, sort of um, uh, movements. Larger, larger women's rights movement because it was already the time that activists, feminists, 
had begun talking about movements in plural. There wasn't a sort of, you know, monolithic, there wasn't one sort of, uh, kind of movement as such. It was also the time uh, when words like third world feminism or uh, femi uh, you know, feminists from the global south, these phrases were already there. So, and then the other thing to keep in mind, this was a time like the 80s and the 90s were also the time when many activists, including feminist activists, were very um, hopeful um, yeah. about internationalism, about the UN system, the, capacity, the ability of the UN system to create a sort of, you know, like international benchmarks, international norms, and then the faith in the human rights framework. So all these things, uh, if we look at the sort of, you know, the world of activism, the world of um, uh, movement, social justice movements, all that was happening. If we just look at the women's rights movement, for example, we had Mexico, we had uh, Nairobi, you know, you had Copenhagen, Nairobi, all these things, the, the, uh, the declaration of the decade of the girl child, for example, 1975 to 85. Around that time, you had Mexico, you had the Second World Conference in Copenhagen, you had the third one in Nairobi, and then 10 years later, you had um, uh, Beijing. So there was sort of, sort of the, I think, uh, you know, the women's movements were on a high. They were sort of, you know, so entering the global space, talking about women's issues. And, uh, and there was a very strong faith in this thing. So that's the, that's the background that we have to keep in mind. The other sort of um, problematic background, if you like, this was also the period when neoliberal economic paradigm was sort of ascending. States were taking, you know, there was a kind of uh, move away in a way from the welfare state. And uh, so the market was becoming a big player. And uh, so there was, so that, that was also the thing. WTO was set up in uh, 1995. So all these things, if you look at the, you know, mix, there was a, there was, uh, there were all these problematic developments going on. There were all these, you know, there was a strong faith in activism, in our ability to do things together, to form collectives, to form alliances, particularly in the women's movement. So that's the, that is the sort of time that we have to keep in mind. Talking, to, uh, talking about the issue of um, uh, trafficking, as I said, it was resurfacing. So GATW's decision, basically, or the women who founded GATW, their decision is, well, everybody is talking about trafficking, but there isn't a uh, definition. There isn't an internationally agreed upon definition of uh, trafficking. And so that's required. There has to be a human rights framework that we can use to deal with the issue of trafficking. So these are the two uh, agendas. And one last thing here, um, the sort of the immediate uh, research that was instrumental in the launch of uh, get W was a piece of research. It was a three years, um, uh, three year long uh, feminist participatory action research that a um, foundation, uh, a women's foundation in Thailand called Foundation for Women that they were doing. And uh, so they were doing that in Thailand and looking at Thai women who had uh, gone to other countries um, and worked. Many of them had worked in the sex industry, had returned, and uh, so that was, you know, so using that study uh, and through the study, looking at the lives of women, looking at the journeys, looking at policies. And then when that uh, research was being uh, launched, when the report was being launched, that was when uh, the decision was taken in 1994, October 1994, that CATW would be launched. Can you tell us more about uh, this research by the Foundation for Women and what uh, what they found? So I think the, the research was listening to, as I said, the methodology was feminist participatory action research. So um, primarily talking to women who had returned back. And so all the interviews were done in Thailand, in different parts of Thailand. 
and spending a very long time. I mean, uh, one of our one of the researchers of the project also worked with the secretariat, KW secretariat, for a long time, and I have visited the villages where the research was uh, carried out. So in those things, so really the researcher was like the participant observer, staying in the community for months together, observing how the women looked at themselves, how the women told their stories, uh, and how the community looked at them, and then looking at, because, you know, they said, today, if we do something like that, there would be a very uh, quick label that these are all trafficked women. That labeling was not that strong at that time. Some people were talking about, uh, thing, but generally people were saying, okay, these women had gone, uh, and, and, you know, they were, depending on what, the kind of uh, phrases people would use. So for example, uh, some people will say, yes, they worked in prostitution or they worked in sex work. Some people will say, oh, they were uh, prostitutes. Depending on who was speaking, these phrases were used, but it was clear that they had gone somewhere. They had earned a lot of money. Some of them had earned good money and their houses were very different. The houses were built, they were better houses and the women were back there. And uh, so the study, looked at their lives, how they made the decision, or whether they made the decision, or somebody cheated them and took them. Uh, where, where did they go? What did they do? And um, uh, you know, what kind of economic, uh, say for example, how much, uh, what did they earn? Or uh, did they not earn much? Did they feel exploited? Did they not feel exploited? And upon return, how, how, what is their life? What is life upon return? So these were the issues. And then the other sort of best research that was done to complement these field work was to look at policies that are there. What are the policies? Are there any policies that talk about women uh, going and working in sex work, for example? Uh, or are these clandestine things that the state either uh, sort of um, calls it a, a bad thing or closes its eyes? What are those uh, things? So what are the policies? And so those are the things that uh, the study looked at. And what it came out, I mean, the, uh, the main finding was, it was really the women on one hand, those who had been quote unquote successful, those who had earned decent amount of money, they're feeling that, okay, we have done something, you know, like my, I have been able to do this, this for my family, or I have been able to do this for, say. so at one level, women feeling they were successful, but not feeling accepted by the community. Sometimes, uh, sometimes the community and the sort of, and as, as far as I'm concerned, coming from South Asia and looking at how the acceptance or rejection is um, kind of, you know, is conveyed in a Southeast Asian uh, community, it was very interesting because it was much more sort of, you know, subtle. It was not a outright blatant on, on your face kind of rejection, but the women were going through all that and, um, and then what they were doing in order to be accepted, in order to get the community's acceptance, for example. So there were many such things and we have, I have spent a lot of time talking to some of the women uh, who, you know, although I came many years later, um, uh, so uh, uh, I've talked to them and then one of the things that they had also uh, said is that, you know, there were, yes, some of them were cheated, some of them didn't know why they were going and um, they, they did feel that, yes, we lost our childhood or we lost our youth and we had to work very hard and it wasn't, you know, so, so there were sort of very mixed stories. These were very layered nuanced stories and um, uh, yeah I think uh, those were some of the some of the things that came out from the study and uh, what was the, one of the recommendations was basically how these stories or this life you know uh, uh, insights uh, from lived experience could contribute to our understanding of uh, trafficking. I think I think this framework is actually really really important um, because even even knowledge production is quite critical, it's quite political, right? Like what we consider authoritative knowledge, what we consider legible knowledge is really important. And 
yeah, we need to go back to people's lived experiences. So yeah, I, I, I think this framework is, is really relevant even now. Yeah, so, so Bandana, some of the things uh, you were speaking about, I was thinking, you know, yeah, these are the, this is how things are even nowadays, you know, 25 uh, and more years later. Um, but what, what changes have you seen in the anti-trafficking field um, in these 20 years uh, since you began at GetW, which was shortly before the adoption of the trafficking protocol? Um, but yeah, either if you want to reflect on the changes that were spurred by the trafficking protocol or some that were not related to it, um, just yeah, what, uh, what are some of the changes you've seen? You know, there are many things that uh, probably haven't changed uh, and, uh, or still continue. Some of the things are still, still the same. In terms of changes, I think uh, we have a lot of legislation now. So following from the Palermo Protocol, um, you know, this is one of the, the last I looked probably a month ago, 175 eight signatories to the protocol. So, so it's one of the most uh, sort of um, uh, ratified or uh, signed um, uh, conventions. Uh, so, so there is, and then all the, uh, you know, many, many states have either uh, modified or amended their previous legislation or have created completely new legislation. So there's a lot of uh, law. We, the second thing is we have many anti-trafficking practitioners, let's say within civil society and uh, NGOs. Then we have many donors who dedicate funding to uh, uh, anti-trafficking work. Uh, we, uh, and then states have their own sort of uh, mechanism, like um, uh, the identification mechanism. There are some states who would have state um, run uh, uh, shelters. Some have state funded and state run. Some are sort of, you know, like NGO run, but state funded. Some are um, just by name, they are state uh, sort of, you know, state has a hand in it or has a say in it, but funding is coming from elsewhere. But let's say the sort of assistance, broadly speaking, the assistance to trafficked persons, there are mechanisms. And um, then we have um, um, some good research on uh, the issue of trafficking. There are uh, many academic, non-academic, uh, sort of, you know, studies, reports. So, so all these are there. Um, so these are the changes that, uh, that have happened over the last 20 years. Like in the beginning, I remember when people would say, okay, so what is trafficking? You know, explain what is trafficking. Perhaps today we are not dealing with that question. There is an assumption that everybody knows what trafficking is. But when you, when you scratch a little bit, when you go a little bit deeper, you know that uh, you know, a, a, in internationally agreed upon definition hasn't necessarily created a common understanding. People can still think of, you know, like uh, um, the, uh, the, one of the earliest studies, the, the research reports that KW brought out um, perhaps in 97 or something, 1997, uh, the one that Lin Chu and Marianne Wires uh, did, the International Research Report. Uh, it talked about, you know, if you are looking at it, if you're looking at trafficking as a problem of prostitution, if you're looking at trafficking as a problem of uh, migration, if you are looking at it as so, so different things, now all those different things that have been listed there, they still exist. It's not, uh, so the perspective, uh, really uh, the different perspectives still exist and that creates quite a lot of confusion. And uh, so uh, people no longer feel um, uh, confident enough to tell, tell you that, oh, I don't know, tell me what it is, because they think that they should know. But uh, so I think that's one of the uh, changes that I see. And many, as you pointed out, um, many practices remain the same. I think um, um, the, uh, the ways to address trafficking 
sometime in the early 2000, this, uh, this framework that people talked about, the three P, the prevention, protection, and prosecution, more or less, I mean, many people may not use that, those uh, terms anymore, but it can still be the framework that people are operating under. So you do have uh, uh, some prevention activities, you have some um, assistance, protection of rights uh, activities, and then you have uh, prosecution. But what is, um, um, uh, what is uh, important to note here is that even though the framework is a sort of, you know, it's a criminal justice framework, it talks about the, the whole, so the mainstream narrative therefore is a trafficker, a traffic person, and, and uh, you know, so, so the traffic person should receive assistance, the trafficker should be punished. So that's the sort of uh, you know, big narrative. And within that black and white narrative, you have many shades of gray, and it's very difficult. And because say um, one uh, example would be, let's say, how can you, have better access to justice or even better prosecution, if you're not interested in access to justice broadly, but even just narrowly speaking prosecution, unless you have a functioning rule of law in your uh, system. Now, so the initial question that we have to ask is, does the judicial system in our country, how has it performed with regard to other victims with regard to other similar issues when working class people are uh, part of the thing. And if it hasn't functioned well there, it will definitely not function well there. But within the anti-trafficking community, we don't uh, make linkages. We don't ask, uh, we don't ask the question, also, oh, you know, uh, rape victims have not been uh, given justice, so trafficking victims perhaps will not. We try to, you know, put in more and more energy in training judges and training uh, thing without asking that fundamental question. So mm -hmm. I think this is one of the uh, problems that I uh, think. I think that three piece uh, framework is still the dominant framework, actually. Um, and a big, like a core strategy under the prevention framework is awareness raising, right? And there seems to be like this consensus that awareness raising is just universally a good thing yeah. and i was curious about this like do you think certain forms of awareness raising are better than others do you think certain forms of awareness raising might actually be counterproductive and obscure the problem rather than make it clearer I'm just curious where you how you see this i think we have to ask whose awareness we do need awareness raising and our own awareness raising that uh, think the awareness raising of people who are, I mean, people like us, I'm not, you know, we are not outside of the anti-trafficking community. And that's something that we really have to kind of own up that we belong to the anti-trafficking groups. So our own awareness, what are we doing to raise our own awareness? How rigorous our social analysis is. It isn't rigorous. So that's the, so, so if we call, if that kind of awareness raising uh, we are talking about, yes, I would say that they're absolutely needed. But when we talk about awareness raising, we talk about raising the awareness of in communities from where trafficking is happening. And I think if it had some relevance at the beginning, at this moment, there is very little relevance. So basically, yeah, whose awareness are we raising? And, uh, and what exactly? The question when you ask, okay, unpack. What do you do to raise awareness? Okay, you write some billboards. You do some, you know, what in India is called wall writing. You write on the wall. And then, <laughs> and then you have posters. You have brochures. You have, um, you know, leaflets and this thing. And it's interesting that we... You know, people like uh, people who do the awareness raising activities in communities are unable to say what is the impact of the awareness raising activity. Did people listen to some people do some studies and try to find out, and but mostly people don't. And so this was the this was hundred percent of prevention work for a long time. Then around sort of you know like I think 
a decade ago or something, the second piece came, which is um, safe migration. And this is and this is very interesting to note because it's not a <laughs> it's not a universal um, thing yet. It does not happen in all parts of the world. So the countries which, for their own reasons, decided to look at out migration or to kind of you know adopt out migration as a policy, employment you know for employment for development whatever. In those countries safe migration became an activity so this is an activity safe migration programs became the anti-trafficking groups work also the migrant rights groups work and basically what what is done there is you provide information and it comes from a realization that okay when we are talking about the horrors of anti -traf horrors of trafficking which was primarily the work of prevention i think the prevention awareness raising was primarily talking about the terrible things that would happen to you. So the horrors of trafficking, and you give the information, but you notice that people are still going. So then the next step was, okay, so people don't care. You tell them about horrors, but they believe that something good will come out of it. So they're still going. So then the next development was to give information so that people will go with information. And uh, so, you know, like, again, linking to Bobby's question, what changes, I think, yes, we from uh, talking about the horrors, we have moved on to talking, you know, giving information uh, to migrate safely. And um, maybe in another 10 years, we'll move on to looking at uh, the working conditions. Uh, so uh, because that's, that's the thing that is the important thing, but if, because just information is proving to be not enough. You know, you have the information, but then do you have any capacity to, any ability to uh, uh, change your working conditions or uh, the thing? So, yeah. Uh, so at the end of July for World Day Against Trafficking in Persons, um, you wrote a blog uh, on the GetW website uh, where you uh, spoke about the need for a course correction uh, in anti-trafficking work. What did you mean by that? What needs to be corrected and it, in what direction it needs to be corrected? One, one thing that is really important for us to acknowledge at this point is to understand that this framework was created to deal with something that was seen as exceptional at that point. So, 20 years ago or 25 years ago, or even longer when people were discussing this, uh, you know, it was seen as something exceptional, something, uh, okay, something terrible, uh, kind of an extreme form of human right violation. 20 years down the road, it's no longer exceptional. So exploitations, you know, if we look at the trafficking protocol, the definition, the elements of trafficking are present in many uh, stories of workers, many lived experiences of workers. If that is the scenario, if it is no longer an exceptional case or no longer an exceptional issue, then we need to have much broader resistance mechanisms, much broader movements we need to and just the anti-trafficking community alone can't do it particularly the anti-trafficking community the, with its you know 3p approach is absolutely not equipped to deal with this this is a huge uh, scene so we need we need um, um, we need people to work with people who have worked on labor rights people who are working with migrant workers people who work with development issues, for example. So, so kind of intersectoral, intermovement uh, work is required, that's one. And that I would say is because then the following question would be also, are we going to stop our anti-trafficking assistance work and just do this? No, it has to continue simultaneously. So that's where a require, I mean, one requires some focus if organization, because these are organizational decisions, if as an organization, we think that providing assistance to trafficked persons is our work, that's fine. 
we continue with that. But by broadening this and saying, you know, like I said, because even that is losing its value, even that is losing its uh, efficacy. So we, okay, if that's our work, we focus on that, recognizing that it's limited, recognizing that, um, you know, even after the assistance is provided, people may again end up in an exploitative situation because the very reason why they left hasn't changed. The, so the scenario on the ground hasn't changed. Now, whose work is that? Who is going to work to change the scenario on the ground? So that's where the, I think that is the fundamental course correction, I think that is required. And uh, so if we want to use anti-trafficking language, then I would say more focus on prevention, but stop, you know, but go deeper, go deeper. Don't say that poverty and unemployment is the cause. Poverty and unemployment are the effects of certain things, are the result of certain things. So why, why poverty? Why unemployment? What is happening? What are the sectors that are being sort of, you know, like what is, what are the labor rights um, situation in the countries? So those are the things that we have to ask. So we can still stay with our three Ps, but we have to go a little bit deeper. We have to redefine it. We have to understand what is this thing. So I think that's the fundamental course correction that uh, I would like to see. Yeah, we need to find the root causes of the root causes. <laughs> <laughs> so what does, in the concrete, what does this model of meaningfully working with and representing vulnerable workers look like? And, and is it possible to actually like meaningfully work with corporations in this fight? Is there a role for them here? Can we even get their buy-in, considering they are among the biggest perpetrators? <laughs> okay, that's two questions, Armila. Sorry. Okay, so no, that, that's, uh, so the first thing, what is a meaningful way of engaging with vulnerable workers? I think the first thing, the starting point would be to understand that vulnerabilities are created. Nobody is biologically, genetically vulnerable. So, you know, how, what are the factors that is aggravating certain people's vulnerabilities? To understand that, what are the sort of policy, what are the systemic uh, reasons, you know, you belong to a particular religion or a particular caste or a particular gender. So is that contributing? Uh, you know, what are the, you know, what are the factors that are aggravating vulnerabilities to understand that. To, for the uh, communities, the anti-trafficking community in this case, suppose we are, we are talking about the anti-trafficking community, so the NGOs workers to understand that, but that's not enough. To work with the people so that they also understand that. So, so that's the next step. That is the next step because it's not enough if I understand or if I analyze, but I must have a language to be able to create that analysis. You know, say uh, the um, more, the easy way to talk about it would be to do a power analysis. How does power manifest itself in the societies? And how do we understand the power imbalances? So not just the people who are providing assistance or doing the projects or the thing, not for the NGO community alone, but the people, the workers, the workers who are in vulnerable situations, the workers who are in uh, exploitative conditions. So what is the, how do they, how do, uh, how is political education of workers happen? Social analysis, how does that look like? The last thing would be to create strategies to bring about change. If I know, if we know, if the worker and the, you know, the advocates together, if they understand that this is the scenario, then how do we bring a change about it? And that's going to take a very long time. It's not going to happen quickly. So, but once one has the understanding, that's the starting point, and then you go on about strategizing. Because, and if you are strategizing, if the advocate and the worker are strategizing together, if there is room for 
the leadership building among the so-called vulnerable workers, then you see that the strategy, even if the strategy fails, and given the time, given the political climate right now, we have you know, authoritarian states, we have democratically elected authoritarian rulers. Uh, so, so in that kind of a scenario, it's going to take a long time. But if you are together, then you will continue to strategize. You will continue to move on. Otherwise, it's like, okay, if, the, if somebody, if the NGO community is trying to do something on behalf of workers, that's going to create frustrations that's going to sort of create alienation. So I think that should be my thing. And this is much easier said than done. It's very, very difficult and it can take a very long time. Uh, so that's one. With regard to the corporations, um, the private sector, I have to uh, confess that at GATW, we haven't really engaged with the private sector. What I feel is, and, and we haven't engaged because we're not very clear how to engage. What exactly, you know, how exactly to uh, go on with this thing. There are many colleagues who have engaged. I think uh, what would be uh, important or what might work is to take a sectoral approach. Say, uh, for example, I can give the example of Asia Floor Wage Alliance, who is one of uh, our partners in, we work together on some issues. Um, Asia Floor Wage Alliance was set up specifically to look at the garment sector, specifically to look at, you know, so they strategized how to engage with the buyers, how to, so their advocacy is very specific. And they came up with a very specific plan that, okay, this is floor wage, and this is how floor wage would be calculated. And then they try to sort of target. So maybe targeted sectoral advocacy with the private sector, I can see some uh, room uh, for uh, thing. But broadly speaking, I don't think that uh, has much meaning. At least I, I don't understand uh, a lot of it. So. Uh, you know, so there are sort of business and human rights frameworks and all that, that there are some progress there, there's some sort of possibilities there, but what might concretely work is this a targeted sectoral um, approach, which you can then monitor. You can know, uh, okay, we tried this, we failed, it didn't work, or we tried this, we succeeded up to this extent. So a kind of measurable uh, kind of advocacy. I think that might, uh, that holds some promise, yeah.